Um, my name is Pat Trundle. I'm the owner of Full Circle uh, Nutrition. We have a retail that we run out of Lanesboro here. And then we also do, we have uh, three dealerships in uh, Minnesota and uh, Wisconsin. Um, our three guys that work with us as dealers in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Um, I'd like to start out with this meeting here. Um, Paul's gonna, Paul Deckard with Diamond T Ag. Um, Paul and I have been hanging out since 1992. Um, started selling feed in uh, Hayfield, Minnesota, and we've kind of grown this uh, ever since then with a few scars here and there. Um, but uh, Paul's going to start out with uh, the recycling part of our program. We're going to kick into Lawrence Mayhew, who's going to talk a little bit more about the science, about some of the things that he's been doing. And then we're going to finish up with uh, Cody, and Cody's going to talk about interceding in 60-inch rows. So, Paul, here you go. So, anyway... Uh, we've been been doing this for a long time and it's coming 12 years on the biological system with compost so this is the 12th year the first five years um, I had a lot of I have a lot of good customers back home and they were brave enough to continue to go with me that got me over the hump because if I would have met you in those days you would have been like get off my farm uh, but I had a, a decent enough reputation where I took a lot of acres with me when I when I started this, and um, it's kudos to those guys that were in the very beginning and helped me understand what was wrong. And I think the reason we're so strong is my willingness to understand that I may not know. And and so I was doing a lot of work with Lawrence Mayhew, who is in the crowd, and he'll be up later. And so I literally spent a lot of money over 12 years with sampling lots of different things. I mean, we're talking thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars that could have been beer, I'm just saying. But we didn't. We did what we needed to do to find out what was wrong and what isn't wrong. So that's what this is about. So what we have unraveled for the American farmer is pretty, pretty awesome. And that is this. We now know that our sampling is not absolutely fact. We know that. And even the one that we do is closer to what it really is, but the good news just starting out is this. You did not deplete one pound of your nutrients unless they went away with wind or water. Otherwise, your nutrients are still sitting there. And there's a sample that nobody else does that we didn't even know that nobody else did it. But I learned in Mankato for the first time that our PT2s that we're gonna talk about today were actually made up by Lawrence Mayhew, right in the back. He was the one that said, well, I need this kind of acid and blah, 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 and here we are. Now we can see almost all of them. So let's move on. Diamond T Ag, winter meeting. One of the things that, that I wanna get everybody to understand, no matter how you till or whatever you're doing, is everything under that ground these are the big ones, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, carbon, and potassium. And these are just more indications of other people that understand that this also works. It's not just me, it's just not my group, our group. It's not just us, other people know it. And, but these all recycle. So just like feeding cattle or anything else, we need to keep the atmosphere right. So what we're gonna be trying to learn today is getting that atmosphere right at, at two inches, to six, eight inches. So it's a four inch uh, gut in your ground. So you can recycle all these nutrients, but you can't do it just by getting out of bed and saying, I'm gonna do it. We need to get biology in there. Not biology from some chemist in a chemistry store or whatever. This is, I figured, let's just do this right. Poop. Poop is the best way to do it. It's full of microorganisms full of amino acids, which we're gonna talk about also. But anyway, all of these recycle, are any of these expensive to buy? Potassium, nitrogen, phosphorus? Anybody sick of buying them? Okay, well you're not gonna be able to change that without changing your method, okay? Here's, here's uh, some very, very, very porous uh, ground, more than likely peat ground, which probably isn't really prevalent around here. But anyway, organic matter is what we're going after. And 
for every 1% of organic matter. This is not great news for us the last two years, I get it. But you know what, we're gonna come out of this cycle, things are gonna dry up again, just like they've been doing for a long time, okay? So 1% organic matter will hold, not, not obnoxiously hold like hydrogen does, okay? Hydrogen is obnoxious, it's, it's not wanting to leave. But this is the good, the one that recycles back. 1%, for every, for every 1%, you get 21,668 gallons of, of water retention per point. So having a bigger, uh, you know, having more organic matter, and I have a one point on my, I have land, but just a little, just a little bit, um, six, six acres, that we grow stuff on too. And I'm at 1.5, so I don't have a lot of organic matter. And it doesn't look like this, but we grow big crop with no P and no K at all. So, but when organic matter grows, all nutrients grow with it. So the number I talked about earlier, even though it's large in your, in your field today, as your organic matter goes up, all of those numbers go up with it. So organic matter is huge, huge. So how do we get there? We need to reestablish structure, okay? And I like this slide. I was, I was in uh, uh, um, Duluth with my grandsons, a grandson at the time, and my family. And I noticed they had this, it's just like, the, it was all salt water. I took a photo, this is an actual aquarium, because this is exactly what's going on in your ground. Exactly. If a barracuda, big fish, comes swimming through here, what all the little fish do? Where are they going? Whoop, down into the coral reef, correct? The same thing's going on in your ground, same thing. Your protozoa and your nematodes are feeding on your bacteria and your fungal. Well, not as much fungal as they used to have, but. That's why they're eating, eating your beans. Anyway, so here's another form of structure. This is the intestinal. Which part of the, which one? Third stomach? Which? Lower intestine. Lower intestine. See the structure? Here's a gut, again, via from Pat Trundle. He found this somehow. But anyway, look at all the holes. And for things, this is, this is the way your gut should probably look, too. And uh, when you have a lot of acid, they'll slough off, okay? That's a nutrition thing, not really a soil thing. But I want you to see the comparison. Now, here is the competition. This particular sample actually specked out scientifically on an x-ray fraction to, to be exactly what we're doing with another gypsum that should be the same. Okay, but this here, the smooth shelves like this, this is not retaining a lot of microorganisms. It's too smooth, that's why you're your table in the kitchen is really smooth to keep the bacteria from, you know, qua you know, growing there. Then the same thing here. This is rocks. This is rock sulfur, um, a calcium sulfate natural, and you can see the smoothness here. See all the, how much of this this particle is smooth. That is not holding microorganisms to help break it down. All right. And this is pretty small. These are very very small. Uh, they're really sucked in. Uh, I can't see which ones they are here. And anyway, they're, we're, it's, the, mag the magnifying glass is really, 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 it's electronic actually. So here's what we're doing though. Here's what a lot of people are putting on their ground is just ground limestone, which you can see the dents. This is just dust, these particles here. But see, they're just dents. They're not really holes. So. This is, you know, you know, you can call it competition or whatever. That's, okay, so here is, you saw the coral reef. Here's calcite. You know, remember you saw, the, you saw the, the coral reef. This is very, very similar, but it's in the dark. And uh, you have the holes, you have the, you have the calcium deposits around there for them to feed on and to hide in so that the protozoa and the nematodes can't eat them. And they come back out when, they're, when there's something to do, when the signal is sent. This is, uh, this is a rock dust sample, uh, and it's at 10,000 magnification. These are actually particles on a particle. So all these holes, all these little ditches and everything in here, all hold microorganisms. And this particular rock dust holds about, I don't know, 72 elements. 
minerals, whatever you want to call them, whatever makes you happy. Anyway, if this particle, which is down in here, was sitting right in front of you, especially if you're over 56, <laughs> 57, I don't even know how old I am, you would not be able to see that particle. And that's what we're putting in our liquids, that's what we're putting in our compost, and everything, Very, we're feeding something extremely small. We've, over, we've overdone this thing. You're feeding something extremely small. This is a humic, this is a humic uh, substance. This one also is at 10,000. We have many, many, many of these. See all these holes and roughness? Okay, the one thing I like about this, this particular humate uh, picture is one of the characteristics of humates is its ability to actually uh, detoxify the ground and your gut, okay, and your cattle's gut. That's why we sell it. Anyway, they sequester it. This is a complete ball. So it's completely surrounded. It's not chelated where it can pull back out. Okay? So that's why I like to use this one. So this may be what this is. When we saw it, I was like, hey, there it is. It's encircling some type of whatever it doesn't want there. And we're like, cool. So we went with it. And this is our mix we call GS or Kelsey Turbo S, I should say. Anyway, so this is all of those calciums, and this is, this is not organic, uh, but it's the gypsum and our uh, calcite turbo blix, uh, mixed together, and we do uh, many, many, many tons of that. This is humic structure again, but this is a liquid. Now, you can look at these, this, how big these things are, but understand, this is 10,000 <laughs> magnification, so this will still go through your sprayer, even though it doesn't look like it will. <laughs> Anyway, but this is what we put into our liquid program. So we don't just, we don't just extract out of, uh, out of compost. We also put product into the LLC that has structure involved so that when the LLC has been sitting for a little while, it has a place to hide, and we know the fungals hide in it to beat the bandwagon. The good fungals. Oops. So microbes primarily responsible for all the cycling, just like we're talking. So everything I've talked about up here is promoting the microbe life, and cycling is what we're really doing, recycling. You already own enough nutrients, even if you're on sand. But it takes about a year and a half to two and a half years, depending on you know, what your ground's got for problems. But and it isn't very long, and you can really pull back on, on uh, phosphorus and potassium and take those costs off your farm. At the pace that, the, that our agronomy guy is working with, because we don't just yank them out. This is not a first year gig. You have to earn the right. You have to earn it. So here's a, here's a study that was done out in South Dakota. It's 13 years in, in the making. These are the first people I know that did it right. In normal, in normal university stuff, unless you've got major bucks, they will move your plot from here to here to here to here by the year. There's no way you can get a consistency of what it was doing to that ground or that plant. So basically, when you do that, you're basically looking for product that's going to stimulate a plant in a synthetic manner making it look good, making it you know, bigger, but is it, is it really good for you when you eat it? Anyway, they did this, this study. And, and they started out, the soil started out at 6.38 and 7.61 pH. And as they went down, now this is this basically what it was, was hog manure and then all dry fertilizer or fertilizer, hog manure, and they were far enough apart where they, that, so they know this is accurate, okay? And they stayed apart for 13 years, or 12, whatever. It's a lot. The pH stayed the same with the manure side, so it was hog manure, but they weren't over applying hog manure either. They were under three grain. They're under it, they're not over it. So, but anyway, the pH stayed the same in those 13 years. The organic carbon went up, so why is that important? I know it's not important on TV, but you really shouldn't be watching it anyway. But the 27% the, the improvement on carbon is huge. 
because it helps your ground uh, become more buffered. And you know, why is that? Because it, it turns into carbonic acid when it hits water. So then that's a natural buffer. Um, we refer to it as yogurt when it's in a little bottle. Anyway, the total nitrogen went up slightly with the manure side. So the total nitrogen in the ground went up. Um, on the fertilizer side, everything's the same except fertilizer versus manure. The pH actually went down to 5.51 and 9.97, which you remember the first ones. Anyway, so it's going, it's going in the wrong direction as far as acidity by using just synthetic fertilizer. Uh, the water soluble aggregates went up with their side. So your, your, your ground's ability to manage water went up by using manure versus just synthetic. Synthetic is not totally the game. There's still some good synthetic out there. Done right. And they went down in the fertilizer system. So the synthetic fertilizer system. So, but th remember, there's 100% synthetic and then 100% carbon. So there's, you know, deviations there. There's some good synthetic and then there's still some bad things with manure if you don't do it right. So the biggest problem with uh, the manure side was the electroconductivity. So we can't just go, I mean, we can. We, we've been putting on liquid manure for a long time, but we need to behave. And you still have to deal with that EEC. But the way to knock that out and not be a problem is actually uh, composting it. And then we just took it to another level when we put, bring the other products in to our compost and made living carbon, which is patented now, too. Go ahead. You said that when you're using liquid manure, you have to behave. Can you define that a little bit more as far as, you know, ideal, in your mind, application rates of both liquid dairy and liquid hog? That's going to do nothing but get me in trouble. Every, half of them are going to be mad at me. So I, I'm, I think that's farm by farm. Who's got more water in it, who don't? And are you on hills, are you on... Go off analysis, I, I'm not going to commit to one poundage. But if I was going to say, you know, hog manure should probably be about 2,000, 2,500, or 2,000 and a half. So, um, and then go out further with it and don't pile it all on. Same thing with dairy. Don't pile it all in one spot. If you can take some of it out further and work your way back home, that's a better plan. So I did that without anybody getting mad, right? Everybody good? <laughs> compost most of it <laughs> you have plenty of it so um, this is uh, this is the sand over in over in Wisconsin this has been on the program for for uh, eight years it's had no P and K for eight years and we grow pretty decent crop there this year we grew hemp um, and and so what I'm looking at is uh, magnesium I know that hemp is a magnesium accumulator. I'm going to talk about hemp a little bit because I know there's enough people interested in it and how do we grow it. It is a magnesium accumulator and basically we proved it. Look at this magnesium here versus uh, here. This is right where we grew that hemp, 131. That is out of control high. But the nice thing is it's this stabilized magnesium. If the plant actually let, so this next crop, this next crop we're going to test it to see how much that mag made it up into that plant. This is not like our normal, oh, my ground's all magnesium tight. No, this is different. And, but it, it's very, very high. And that's why I wanted to do it. And, uh, and, it, and it worked out. This is very low organic matter. And I have very low CECs. And uh, this woods is only two years in production. And it's been cover crop the first year. And then it was corn and, corn and beans underneath them for another kind of uh, cover crop. Um, but we went in so late because of the hemp that it all just got mowed down. Um, it looked pretty good, but it was moldy. And you know, I was having the same problem every other human was having. So nothing magic. But anyway, is it, this is interesting. This is the kind of stuff I do on my old ground, so you don't have to do it. <laughs> so it's not a lot of ground. And then, but the nice thing is my sand is definitely flowing, water is flowing. But look at my TKN, road, 940. 
and my woods is only two years old, is only 600, which you can double this for my protein or nitrogen. And that's, you know, just about a ton of nitrogen in that stuff, holding, sitting there. But, and then we have our other numbers. We always do a PT2. Um, I do want to mention that the PT2 is something that uh, Diamond T. Egg, Lawrence Mayhew, uh, got started with uh, Midwest Laboratories. So I did not know that until Mankato. I thought they just had it normal, but apparently it was Lawrence. So what we're seeing here is that sand, you saw that, you saw that P and K, the P and the P and K looked a little bit in trouble, but it's not, it's still there. It just, it just recycles. So we'll go into more of that during this, this deal. Cattells, they are a, a very big dairy, a farm, uh, seven, 600 acres-ish, I don't know, eight. Anyway, we've been on the program for a little while, and he's running three eight organic matters, four O's. Um, you look at your potassiums here. This is what you get to see from not only ourselves, but from the co-op, because this is normal, normal strategy. Here's our, here's our phosphorus. And if you're on a manure management plan, you, you still want to go completely water soluble, which would be this way. This is P1, but it's not absolute water soluble. Um, but, and so you get lower numbers on your P, and then that's what you show the government. But I want the other sample to see what's really there. So um, those, those numbers you saw on the K, they said you might be in a little bit of trouble. You gotta take all these numbers and double them, and that's how much potassium's in the top, eight inches. Go to the next slide, you'll have everything side by side. Oh, oh right. right. Oh, we'll there, there you go, go. thanks. thanks. So, so um, help, help me out, out here, Pat. Pat. Um, so on that slide, you know, we put everything, I mean, we just took Midwest Labs samples and we put them side by side on a part per million basis. So we'll take a look at the nitrogen here on this, we'll just look at R1 going all the way across. We got 19 parts per million of nitrogen that you see on your, on your light grain test on the front of your of normal sheet that you've got forever. So that would mean in that soil, you'd have 38 pounds of nitrogen available for use of that up until 10, 12 years ago, that's what we would tell you. Yep. Yep. But what we're finding on the PT2 test or the, 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 the total uh, TKM test too, it's kind of a similar number, <coughs> is that we actually have 2,781 parts per million. It got times two, a little over 5,400 pounds of nitrogen out there. In the top eight inches. And that we can access if we earn the permission to access. Recycle. Recycle it. And that goes down the line too on the, uh, that field R1. As you take a look at the phosphorus here at 74 is what we can normally see, and it's, but it's actually 688, so we're talking 1,300 pounds of actual phosphorus sitting out there. The next one down, potassium, we got 88 to 814, that's 10 times as much potassium out there. But again, we gotta have that soil, you know, living, breathing, and going in. We've gotta make sure, we're, basically, the biggest thing we gotta address is to make sure that we don't have any heart pain. Paul's gonna talk about Yeah, I'll get on that, yeah. I'll get in trouble for that again. Yep. Anyway, so what we've been doing as a group is trying to figure out why we are where we are. And then, and we're not going to overstate what we can do. So in order to get started on this system, we need a soil sample and we need to deal with whatever you have for a problem first, because we did not create magic. This is putting the natural system back into place and recycling your nutrients, which we know now, because we're, we're 12 years old, that our older clients are very happy with the results financially, which I think we're all about. So this is just more information about the PT2 analysis, which is, but this is uh, 276 fields, and uh, you look at your average out there, of N. This is just the average, and here's the average of, of phosphorus. Here's the average of potassium in our, in our area, you know, Wisconsin, Minnesota. And, and here's your sulfur. The one thing that we've got to remember about sulfur is its unique ability to, what, you see, we big into compost and manure. And what's in manure and compost is amino acids. And the only way that you can get your protein back up in all your feeds is to have is to have sulfur because sulfur is also helping it turn from you know a nitrate 
into a protein. And that's done by taking, and, and the microbes attach lysine, methionine, cysteine on the molecule, and, or the nitrate ball, and now it becomes a true protein. Always, always remember that. You want to grow food for your cattle or for anybody, or just better prices on wheat, then this is how you do it. When you are actually looking, this is what the industry said you need to know. This is all you've been able to see is right here, 46. This is what we based our farms on. This is what we based our, our incomes on. When in reality, you owned this. I didn't know it either. When I, <laughs> when I first saw this, I'm like, well, this is crazy. But then once we started to figure it out, then I went from crazy, you know, to I was kind of mad. I was kind of mad for a little bit because I, I, I swallowed the Kool-Aid. I worked for some pretty good outfits. And they told me this is where it is and this is how it happens. And I found out otherwise when I figured this out. Once we figured this out, it was game over. And here's just another one on potassium. You're sitting at 142. Well, that's not, you know, 125 in the old school. We probably would have said you probably don't need it. But there's a lot of people that still would have put it on. Okay? And, there, and you actually own 970. So the reality of being able to get your ground to recycle will never happen with synthetic fertilizer alone. It will never happen. We have already proven that it doesn't happen. You put on more and more and more and more. Every two or three years, you're putting on more. What if you could recycle your nutrients and reverse that back the other way? Well, you can, even organically and, uh, and in the, uh, conventional, both. So one of the things that... Uh, I know nobody did until Diamond T. Ag did it. And to me, it was just common sense. Chloride is your most soluble, hands down nutrient. And it's in rain. You'll find that out later, too. But it's in the rain. So when the chloride starts to stack in your field, your parts per million go up. Here's, here's good. Here's, you better start thinking about looking for some hard pan. Something's holding that water up. And this is not about hydrogen now. This is just saturated ground. And then at 15, you definitely have a hard pan. Definitely have a hard pan. And so I think the next one's a little bit bigger. There you go. So basically, from here this way is pretty much, uh, pretty much normal soil. But everything this way is hard pan. Even these two are in question. And this one's in question also. If you look at this line, most people are over here. So you don't have to get nervous. But if you're over here, in which we will know with, with a soil sample easily, very economical. Once we have that, then we go out with a probe and we check it. So what I'm saying to you is if you have a hard pan, we need to figure out how deep it is and how we're going to deal with it. With the cover cropping system, we don't have to worry about going out there and, and blowing our soil all over the place because you could put a cover crop in and then they would work together because then you could put a you could get a um, a subsoiler with no wings or anything on it and you could go crack that and then your cover crop is still sitting there punching sugar and carbon and everything else into that ground and then and then in the spring you do whatever you want with that cover crop and get right back at it we haven't been able to do much of this breaking of this hard pan for the last couple of years because I've uh, been getting a lot of rain, a lot. I was starting to build a bigger boat. So, but once that stops, that clay is gonna tighten back up and we have to resample and see if you got chloride issues. Once your ground gets very biological, the hard pan gets, it, it's easier for the, or it's, it's a lot harder for the hard pan to come back. You can get your, your own hard pan going, you know, it's usually shallow with your equipment, I get that. But it can recover if it's healthy. So here's one, of the, here's one of the ideas. I like this one the most because right here is your plates, okay? And then and they're, this, you know, they're wide this way, this way. And then this is not that wide. So when this goes through, when it's the ground in between this one and this one is being shattered, okay? So it's just a line through your ground. Is this here? This doesn't do anything else but that. This, this just... It's just causing the shattering. So 
if you if you're into no-tilling or something like this is a very unaggressive topsoil mover especially if you put a cover crop in there to hold it when you do it okay and well anyway that's that one hydrogen hydrogen indicates water saturation oh we want the definition right hydrogen because I say H a lot and I get in trouble for it because it's actually hydrogen. Yep, yep I know, I'm, I'm learning. And, and indicates water saturation, which is different than, than when I'm talking about chloride where the water's stacking, okay? This is, a, this is actually, uh, involves the colloids of your soil and the H is taking the place of potassium and things like this that we need to get into that plant. So it's making it difficult for that to happen. So we need to deal with hydrogen, and we have that in Minnesota, in different places in Minnesota and Missouri. We do not have it very often in Wisconsin, but we do have it when I get out here. And we need to figure out a way to get that to lower or drain, one of the two. And it's not, so basically we have, we do have synthetic opportunities, which is a slow release potassium, that is, it's, is, is not a lot, it's right in the row. We have the opportunity possibly in organic, but we also ha we have it in conventional. We have access to it, we do not own it, but we found other people that have the same problem that live in a high H area. <laughs> and we've had some customers that didn't do good um, because their ground held all this water. There was no way for potassium to get to it. Okay, because your plants are signaling and they're pulling that potassium through an enzyme structure back to the plant and robidium which is in compost is the, the driver and when you disrupt that it's usually with H because the, uh, the enzyme is aerobic so when the enzyme can't breathe it can't haul potassium to your to your plant because what really happens is your plants gr grow get water get signals things like this the mineral comes to your plant your roots don't go to the mineral, they call it to themselves. It's like I proved with magnesium, that's why I did it. It's to prove that there's a signal and it's bringing it to them, okay? Anyway, um, generally it places and then commonly locks potassium, plant becomes increased hydrogen, enzymes also for moving potassium is aerobic, okay? Here, is, here was the game changer in the very beginning. I had, I had, you know, I was really excited about this opportunity of compost, yada, yada. We're going to win. It's going to be awesome. Well, didn't quite work out that way. The ball game was a little tougher than I thought. So what I'm saying to you is that I had, uh, in the fifth year, you know, I was having, or fourth year or so, I was seeing this, this split. We were doing exactly the same thing on every ground. And I was having a 55% success rate. Now, if I was just about, you know, making money and yada, yada, good enough, you know, 55, that's pretty good. But in my very Scandinavian brain, it wasn't good enough. So we needed to figure out what the problem was. And I was stumped. I was stumped. I didn't know what to do. And this was not just a few acres. And I had stack. So I, I talked to Cool Man. I said to God, if you want me to help your people, you better help me understand what this is. Because there's no way you're going to figure this out as a human because I did exactly the same thing on every chunk and and I had these kind of results or you know not you know just barely made a money and then I'd blow out 20 bushels over here really the same thing so what came to me here is divide the pH by CEC just just like you and me talking to each other it's weird right in here anyway so I did I had to determine seven pH so I did and seven is no neutral I divided by 14 here is your new pH this is a biological pH this is for bugs 0.5 is when you divide your pH by your CEC 0.5 is neutral and 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 when you look at this when I was in Wisconsin I have a lot of five pH and back in the day I didn't know how to feed them <laughs> It's, I must only want to stick my finger in there. It's too hot, you know. Anyway, but if you were below a ten, you were below. You were out. You were alkali, and so I started helping a lot of people in Wisconsin right here in my own ground too. 
the pH is, is like no way. And, and so we're actually alkali over here, a lot of places. Okay, just common sense. I had a guy working with blueberries. Came to me, I, I want blueberries, and they, they, like, they like acid. Think about that. The ground that's growing sugar likes acid. Okay, well, I wasn't buying it. I said, well, I, I said, where do you grow your blueberries? In the sand? He goes, well, yeah, they love sand. They love the acid. I said, they don't love acid because how do you get sugar out of acid? The stomach's upset. How are you building sugar? He's like, well, I said, what you have is this problem, that there's another pH, uh, you know, for, the, for this system. So 5 pH for making paint is accurate. We're not changing this. But for feeding bacteria, we changed it. Because now the blueberries, now he doesn't call me anymore, so he must be making good bank now, right? He forgot to send me some tips, but whatever. Anyway, and the same thing, in the, I got called into the Christmas tree industry because the other people who are in fertilizer business were trying to get people to feed their Christmas trees all kinds of calcium. I said, why are you doing that? Said, I mean, Christmas trees grow all over the place. And so I looked at their soil samples, same thing. They had determined that the trees weren't growing fast enough because it was too acidic. And <laughs> guess what? They weren't even close. And, and so I, and everybody started changing it back the other way. Now, I'm not in the Christmas tree business, but they, I went in to help them. And it was the same deal as blueberries. So it's the opposite up here, eight. So this is too alkali. Not if it's 16 CEC, you're back to neutral. So this problem is out in Colorado. And when I was in Colorado, I had the same issue, but in reverse. He's doing 250 plus. His com he called the combine, hey, what are you doing? And I looked at his soil, and he told me 250. Well, I don't know how to grow 250 bushel in alkali. But it wasn't alkali. It was neutral, but I didn't know it until after I got that information in here. Now, we've had a very, an uptick on success because we're going to look for that stuff now. We're going to know that it's there and we're going to make the adjustment. Because you got to remember, my goal is that we grow more crop for less profit as far as, you know, your cost. Your cost. You want to lower your cost, grow more crop, and maintain your intestine in your ground. The humus. Keep recycling it. Grow more crop for less money and maintain it in such a way that it grows. You cannot do that synthetically. So here's, here's where I was taught. 6.4 to 7.2 grows the best corn. Old system pH, correct? No, anybody got no, right? That's what we're used to. So in ours, which mimics this, is 0.45 to 0.52. That's our biggest corn, biggest crops. So it really, it skirts right along with these guys here, this one. Below 40 is acid. So anything under here is acidic and we need to deal with it with calcium, calcite, calcium, lime. Okay, so in the very beginning, we gave it a credit. We gave it a credit. And after a bunch of years, so it was only two years ago that we changed it. But we used to give you a credit for organic matter all the way up to the lemon. But we started to recognize that something was changing. And now we know that once we have a real organic matter, that's one that's alive, not a bunch of dead stuff in it, okay, alive, that what I just told you two, two slides ago is hoopala. Doesn't matter. I don't know what happens, but the ground takes over the situation. But below that, we need to help it get there. And that's why we do what we do. Does that make sense? Once you get up in here, this should have been, we should be giving you credit because you got all this organic matter. But for some reason, we found out you don't need to do it. Once you're a real four, then we don't, you don't need to use lime and all that happy stuff. So once again, microbes, primarily responsible for all that activity. Every bit of that activity is done by microbes. It's not done by Pat. The microbes do it. So. The better we get at feeding microbes, which is compost is full of microbes. And what do microbes use to take the sulfur that we've put in there also 
to make true protein for all your corn silages, haylages, all the things that you want your cattle to do better on? What do they need? Amino acids. Amino acids are needed very badly. They're only in the compost. They're not in, no one's running around selling amino acids because they're too expensive. You dig them out and put them back in when you could do it a lot more economically with poop. Just saying. So this is why we want to keep reminding you through this whole program, or at least in this, on these slides, that everything recycles. It just keeps recycling. So if we want to really be good at farming is get that working for you, period. That makes you money. Even if you use somebody else's poop. I'm not offended. At least you did it. And then you're going to grow heavier test weight, better crop on years that make sense that you can do it. These last two have been a little, a little rammy. There's no doubt about it. So one of our products is Kelsite Turbo S. Well, this is a blend of calci calcite calcium and sulfur, um, gypsum type products. And uh, we, we use a lot of it. I mean, 500 pounds an acre on manure. We don't just spread it out there for fun. If you have manured ground, this is one of our choices right here. Um, DTA Kelsite Turbo S Organic is a different formula. And that is using elemental sulfur, and we're putting that in. And we're setting up a system today that's going to be extremely competitive on the organic side and conventional, utilizing elemental sulfur, which is a very good marriage in the ground. So and I think we're going to stay right in there uh, competitively. We're going to start that this year here and there and see how we do. And then DTA Living Carbon Organic is our our normal living carbon, but utilizing sulf elemental sulfur versus gypsum, gypsoil. But never rock, never rock gypsum, just from either the plants or from um, either elemental or gypsoil in the mix. And then the reason we do this up front is because once you get it into the gut, which is the compost, it starts to send the signals. It starts to break it down to make it usable for plants. So one of the reasons that we do what we do is that you're in the spring, when you put, you know, put it on in the fall or put it on in the spring or during the winter in the snow, when that starts to wake up, you have more army helping you convert faster. And that's why we're seeing our success. And then liquefied living carbon um, is a product that we um, have made and continue to make. And it is uh, an extract. Uh, you know, using diffusers. And we have a lot of mineral that comes into this, this game. And so we tested it. And we do a lot of testing of mineral, but I know that Lawrence is going to go through that too. So you're going to get a, a way better education of how that all happens. But one of the things I like to, and there's our carbon number that showed up. This is when we were doing parts per billion. Um, now we're doing parts per trillion because we want to know. So we spent the money. So when we're standing in front of you saying, we can do this, we really can. We're not guessing. And uh, where's my robidium? Right here. So there's robidium. And these are enzyme cofactors, by the way. All these are enzyme cofactors. And, you know, I know a lot of people have heard of phytase enzyme, correct? Anyway, robidium is the, is the mineral that is associated with the enzyme that's bringing the potassium to you. And it's right in the poop. So you're not going to get that in a fertilizer. And even if man could do it, what would it look like? It's not the natural one. Just like a lot of the traces you buy, they're metal. They're not actual traces. They just show up like that in a, in a, in a, in a machine. The ones that are actually made by microorganisms are real. It's like aspirin. All your aspirin is synthetic, every bit of it. But it actually came from a plant many, many years ago. And it's the opposite. It, when you, they took a photo of it, it's in reverse. But it still works for me. I mean, it works. But it's not natural. And I'm not mad at that. Just more traces. And you're going to get enough of that later. The gift is the newest product. Uh, two years ago, did some, sam you know, did some foliar out there. The purpose of this goes to the, the chemical pursuit was a signal. So this was, this was designed as a signaler. 
and there's 70, 72, we'll, we'll, we'll say there's 72 in there, but there's more than that, but just in case somebody misses one, we don't get in trouble. But there's 72 elements in this product. There, I mean, there's a lot, of, a lot of nutrients in there. Diversity to build real health in your proteins and everything else. What we're doing right now with just MPK, that's really not enough mineral to actually replenish the ground. And plus, manure is going to help us with the bacteria and everything else to recycle what you already own. Uh, soil release is also made by our company. And what that is is a humic product that has, we put uh, um, other, we put uh, worm castings in it also. And so we dissolve them and put them into this. And we use other products also to make this a very effective product. And it is very black. And it's one quart per acre um, with, uh, L with LLC, liquid living carbon, at three gallons. This is one quart. But if you are addicted to the red balls, you're not going to see them. <laughs> you need to switch to magnets or something like that. But this is more structure and mineral. Um, the guy that's going to talk about cover crop today is like 100,000 times better than me. But I always put the slide up saying, I am pro cover crop. When I can, I want to. But he'll do a better job of that. When, we're, when our program is working, we are getting our, our probes down to 21 inches under 300 PSI. If you can do that during the summer, you're doing good. This is uh, a place that had very hard pan, a lot of hard pan. And that's why I think that when you have a hard pan that is really difficult, quit waiting. Put the cover crop in, grow it up, and then go through it with a subsoiler. It's not going to hurt nothing. I don't care who, how you write the book. It's not going anywhere. Your ground's not going to blow away. You still got sugar. But you cracked the hard pan because they didn't. It's too much hard pan. It's too hard, too deep. Uh, this is a, a, a dirt out in Nebraska, soil out in Nebraska. And if you look at this, it's a low calcium or low magnesium, high calcium. And when it rains, the rain is going this way, not this way. Okay? And here's uh, yeah, deep chisel, 16, buffered soil, uh, fixed compaction. Yeah, we fixed it. We went through it with the subsoiler and magnesium 25 plus. Just in case you're wondering, why, you know, I redid all the slides for Paul. So yeah. this is the first time he's seeing a lot of them. Yeah. yeah, I'm winging it. Anyway, I'm not totally winging it. But anyway, so after a couple of years, 500 pounds of living carbon, three and a half ton of feedlot manure uh, composted. It was... Uh, the second year, 500, three and a half ton of, of feedlot manure, three gallons of liquid living carbon, one quarter release, and soil release, and three gallons of NPK starter. And this is the end of the second year. Same farm, same pivot. It worked that fast. So we don't have to sit around and wait for all this stuff that we you know take forever to happen. This is a gentleman that uh, worked on the program. He was an uh, absolute no tiller. Um, I explained to him some things about no-tilling that we needed to address. He addressed them. He's still a no-tiller. Um, but it's more of a till when needed. And so we needed to crack some of that ground. So uh, he ended up, see what you got written here. It, his average was 235 at the end, but he started at something like 170, 180 across all acres. What he's standing in front there is 270. And he is still doing this to this day. And he hasn't had to put any kind of tillage into his ground for quite some time again. But the first two years, we had to really give her, okay? Um, this is some ground in Texas that we were working with. They'd never seen this much uh, root systems in their ground at all. And that was biologicals. Same thing here. You're not going to have, you'll have a hard time doing this in, in Minnesota because your ground is harder. This is sand. So it's kind of a trick kind of a trick photo. <laughs> we can't really grow roots that big in, in, in tighter soil. This is sand. So when you do it right, they can really give her. Um, this is a company, uh, a person, um, uh, Rick Haney. He, uh, he works for the, uh, the government. And, and they came out with this here system. 
And all those numbers we gave you, this is a health, uh, a soil health deal. We only go out in July, but we go out in July every time. And we go in the row. Because I'm not trying to prove anything other than to ourselves. So we're not, we're not cheating if we're looking at it for our own selves. So we go in July. But anyway, all these numbers right here are actually created during the growing season by the organic acid increase in nutrient availability in red zones. And look at here. So these numbers you already saw, here's more of them. Back this. I just want to emphasize what Paul just said on that, that when we're looking at the soil health test, we're on the brick eating test, we're just going out in July, and there's a reason for that. If you take a look at, um, we had Jim Fashing here a couple of years ago with Midwest Labs that, that did the, the, the one year presentations for us, and he'll agree is that as you're looking, you know, they've done studies year round on soil health tests, and they just naturally go up during the summer months. Mm -hmm. And where we have seen other companies coming in is that they'll do a soil test in, or a soil health test in March April. So that you see on the soil health calculation it goes from zero to 25, we'll end up with like a 13. Now we bring this product in, in April, May, and then they come back you know, and do a soil health test in um, that July, August range, and they'll see a 10 point bump in the soil health. So this that, that particular individual product bumped your soil health score by 10%. It, it didn't. I mean, it, it, uh, if you had done the, um, nothing, it probably would have done you know, similar to this. That's why we always want to look at the same time every yeah. year. I would say second week of July, first week of August. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's the same thing with the back in the day, the sugar, rectet, the, you know, that sugar deal. And now, it's, uh, and now they have the deal where they're uh, testing your nutrients in your uh, tissue, tissue samples, hoopla. So was the sugar deal. And it's because of exactly what he's saying. If you're smart enough at this game, I come out and sell you something in April, we take a test. And then in, in July, ooh, look how big it got. Okay, so we're not going to do that. We're going we're gonna to go out in July and see if our system's working. I just like to sample because look how bright, look how that, or this slide. Look how nice and healthy that is. That's on our program. Lots of tons. Triticale. This gentleman here, he was the one that actually was my, my educator for how to grow beets. So we're pretty good at growing beets now, too. Uh, Pat, Pat, yes, yes. here we go. So we've done a lot of fungicide, and I know there's a lot of people addicted to, some, you know, to that stuff. So I have, Pat and I have run into some people who have an opportunity to put that fungal that's keeping your crop healthy back in. There you go. Okay, as, so the big talk right now is bacteria, fungal, you know, going in the soil, different ways of getting it there. Um, the well-known fungal that everyone knows is mycorrhizae fungi. It's a good product. Um, there's a couple different sources. We believe we've, we've ran across a good source for the mycorrhizae. But in that process, um, with Paul's business that he does out west, he ran out uh, into an individual there that is uh, um, promoting a product called Bavaria bosniana, and I'm only going to say that once. Um, but that is more of a um, plant health type fungus. Um, where they're applying that in the row, or, or excuse me, in the liquid on the row, or applying it right in the seed box. And your bottles are where, Paul? You know, so there's, you know, they got a lot of good numbers as far as reducing molds and mycotoxin, as far as um, where they've done side-by-sides with uh, earworm and stock, uh, 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 stock bore. Um, you know, they're... It's something that we want to look at this year and get it on some places where we're positioning it is this. If you are a conventional farmer growing non-GMO seed or you know, just a Roundup Ready uh, uh, conventional farmer, I think that, that's an opening for it. Um, if you're on organic and uh, you, so you don't have a, that huge toolbox available for, you know, for something like this, um, or if you're experiencing a lot of molds and mycotoxins in cattle feed. I mean, that's really, really where I think it, that we're placing it. Um, it's gonna run. Under wire, under some guys under, big, under those big wires, you have more disease than those, that's exactly where we're going. Yeah. yeah, so Paul over in Wisconsin runs underneath some of these high power lines. Where, where the power lines run, the crops are, are not as good. You know, so that's where they're trying to put that into, you know, to get that into that whole uh, plant health thing. Um, I believe that the, the pricing on it is going to run about $15 an acre. 
on conventional, about $25 an acre on organic, just because of the different carriers they got to use to go in the organic. Exact same bug, different carriers. We can talk about it more after these. Yes, absolutely. Right? Yeah. Yep. No, so I'm we're, done. we're, over. I'm done. Yeah, yeah, you get out of here. Anyway, so what I'm saying is here we are. This is what we're doing. We're not going to oversell what we're doing. We're going to find out who you are, how, why you farm, and then, and then fix the mechanical first. And then what are, what are you going to be growing? How are you going to be growing it? That's who we are. And we have a very good, solid program. And with that, though, I'm going to. I'm pretty sure that's it. Just a second. I'm gonna that right oh, that's not the clicker. No. So before we, I this so before we go to lunch, one of the things that Diamond Tech does sponsor is homeschool uh, CDs for some people that want to homeschool their children. They are not any denominational base, but they are very Christian based. And these are about 75 bucks a piece, and I give, I give them away a set at every meeting that's actually homeschooling. And, uh, and then the other thing that we sponsor is the guys that have actually did the math over the last 26 years and have uh, basically proven that creation that we're really not the downline monkeys. So that's pretty cool. And this is a geology, a lot of ge I read geology. Um, I'll try to stay ahead of the game. And then this is a book that I got when I was uh, 18. Not this one, this is the exact copy, 18 years old. And what I inherited from my grandfathers was two books. They both said, you don't have to die. My grandpa Decker gave me his Bible, I got his Bible, and which I do not read, it's a nice little thing. And then the other one was this book originally. What's interesting about this book is the guy in this book actually cured cancer, colon cancer, in the 1950s. So this book was taken off your shelves and burned, and he was thrown out of the United States. So I give away one of these, and if you do take it, my only ask is that you you're done reading it, did you give it to somebody else? Because this happened to us. 1950, this book was burned. You may want to read it. Anyway. Yeah, well, we've well, we got two guys to introduce here. You want to do, yeah. Go ahead. yeah, you get out of the way. <laughs> okay, so with Full Circle Nutrition Retail, um, you kind of the face out in countryside is Nate Boyum. And, uh, you know, Nate doesn't like to do a lot of talking up front, but I'd like to, Nathan, you know, they're, they're our face in the in outs there, to introduce our former feed rep. So I'm going to let Nate go ahead and do that. So I don't know if everybody's aware of it, that Full Circle Nutrition is the distributor and dealer for, for this area, and we also work on the uh, feed side also. So um, just want to let you know what our abilities and what we can do. And uh, so Mike Root is our rep. We work through the company called FormaFeed. And so we just want to introduce Mike and and uh, let friend. yes let you know what uh, what we, what we do when we run around out in the country and burn gas. So two hours, right? Two minutes. Oh, two minutes. Okay, I misunderstood. Please. Okay, um, Forma Feed is kind of a is a company that's not well known in southeastern Minnesota. Um, I started with Forma Feed a couple of years ago. Uh, a little over two years ago, um, coming from a different competing company and um, working on growing the business in southeast Minnesota. Uh, FormaFeed is a is a small family-owned company um, based out of Stewart, Minnesota, which is west of the Twin Cities, about, I suppose, 60, 70 miles. Um, we have a manufacturing facility up there with the same capabilities as any other feed company. It's just that we're, we're family-owned, a little more down-to-earth type of company. Um, we, we have dairy, beef, swine, horse, whatever, same nutrition as other, other companies do too. Um, I work side by side with uh, Pat and Nate with any you know, questions or any issues they have. Um, if I can't figure it out, I get them to the right people. So anything else?